Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. And you know, things are a lot looser here. You have, you have beer. You can sit and drink a beer and enjoy a lecture. I can't imagine any place in the U.S. where we'd be allowed to do that on a university campus. Maybe I'm being a little bit um, pessimistic there. But anyway, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to talk in particular about a large test that I had the opportunity to be a part of about five years ago now. Um, I suppose I'm going to have to stop talking about it at some point, but <laughs> it still seems like it was just yesterday. Uh, it was really anticipated to be a run-of-the-mill proof of seismic resiliency, but ended up um, seismic resiliency of seismic isolation, but ended up um, unearthing some pretty interesting issues. And being an academic, I had a, a fun time just really getting into those issues. Um, and I'll definitely share some of them with you today. And more recently, I've found myself pondering, um, you know, what does this all mean in terms of the ability of this system to provide seismic resiliency? Where, you know, is, does it matter? Where are we now? And um, where, where do we need to go? So I'll try to provide a little bit of perspective on that. As an introduction to the test program in particular, um, large test program on innovative isolation systems, it was a collaboration of the NIST TIPS, much larger research project uh, that Quincy mentioned, as well as the NIST Non-Structural Grand Challenge project in the US and the NIED funding agency in Japan. We ended up performing tests at Japan's e-defense facility in uh, August of 2011. Um, after a couple years, we held a project wrap-up workshop in September 2013, a room full of practitioners, learned all about what happened during that test. Matt Cutfield was there. <laughs> Hi, Matt. <laughs> um, we had several dissertations and theses resulting directly from this project, and I still have one more student working on it. I also feel like I need to mention um, everyone that was involved, direct investigators. I mean, I'm not going to read the names, but lots of direct, um, investigators directly involved, academic collaborators, and industry collaborators and sponsors, and all of that help was really important. So I give a, just here a, a brief list of shake table testing that's been conducted on isolated buildings. Unfortunately, this is very US centric, but you can see there's been a lot of shake table tests. And um, the conclusion on almost all of these tests, same thing, no damage to the structure, even in very large motions. So why do another test? Well. Let's look at some of the structures that they tested, and I'll show some pictures here um, from some of those tests. And you can see they kind of all share some things in common. They tend to be reduced scale, bare frame structures. As such, they tend to lack realistic floor systems using added mass for inertial properties. You can see the mass in many of these systems. They, as a result of that, also lack non-structural components, which is important for resiliency. And in many of them, not all, but in many, most the table shaking is 1D or 2D, no vertical input. So our project was able to address um, most, I say all of these issues. The scope of the tests, we tested the building in three different configurations, isolated with a triple friction pendulum system, isolated with a hybrid configuration of lead rubber and cross linear bearings, and fixed at the base. We did not design a structure specifically for this test, but, uh, but to save costs, um, reused a building that had been developed and tested for another project a couple years before that. It was slightly, but not, not really damaged. It was essentially um, good to go after the first set of tests. This was a steel moment frame, Japanese design, with box columns and wide flange beams. Um, just make the point that for, it was very stiff and strong compared to a moment frame that would have been designed in the US. Had a period of about 0.7 seconds determined from system identification testing. We estimated the plastic uh, first yield strength at about 70% of the weight, so pretty stiff and strong. Um, the weight of the structure, about 5,000 kilonewtons. So the test program was really developed around this triple pendulum system and showing that uh, primary objective to demonstrate seismic resiliency of the system in a very large event. Show that, we wanted to show that it could 
provide continued functionality and minimal disturbance to the contents. The second system with the lead rubber bearings got pulled in kind of later in the, in the project. Uh, the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission got interested in testing specifically lead rubber bearings out to um, large lead rubber bearings out to very large displacements. So we had a chance to look at that system as well. In order to meet the first objective, we needed to include non-structural components. This is where the Grand Challenge project got involved. They um, de designed and built uh, an integrated ceiling, partition wall, and piping system on the fourth and the fifth floor. It was a nearly identical configuration over the two floors with some differences in the way the ceilings were detailed and the partitions were detailed. Here's uh, some pictures ceilings, um, partitions in the background. This picture is above the plenum and you can see the fire sprinkler piping. And then we also had a couple of enclosed contents rooms with you know, mostly loose contents, not really damageable, but we were attempting to show kind of how they would perform. The structural system itself was slightly asymmetric. This picture shows a typical floor plan and this outlines uh, the layout of the girders, main girders. So you can see in the one direction, there's unequal bay width. So slight asymmetry to start with. And then there was also some added mass to the specimen um, concrete blocks at these locations on a typical floor, which is slightly asymmetric in configuration. So we thought, oh, this is a great ex uh, opportunity to examine the two systems and how they respond to torsion. We uh, proposed to enhance the asymmetry a little bit more by putting this added mass at the roof in a largely asymmetric configuration. The original structure had these steel plates all along the roof. We actually removed them on the other side. Roof was designed for them, but I'd point out this is, was a, a large weight, 535 kilonewtons, so it was about 10% of the weight of the structure at the roof. Um, this ended up having an implication not only in the torsional response, but in the way it responded under um, vertical shaking as well. Another um, little thing that impacted the test results was that the building had originally been designed to be bolted to the shake table. So it had a very um, stiff base diaphragm, which it would be kind of atypical. Um, or, this is, it shows a plan here, and around the columns, which are very tiny, there were these um, column bases with stiffeners. This picture kind of shows one right here, and there's the column extending upward. So very, very, very stiff, and it dramatically shortened the free length between the girders on that base floor. And then there was also this horizontal bracing in plane. This had a big impact in how the, um, high, um, how the lead rubber bearing system responded. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about the design of the two systems. The triple pendulum system, we worked closely with Victor Zayas of EPS um, to design that system. Basically said, I wanna pick the largest motion that the e-defense table can reproduce and show that, design a system that can go through that. So we looked at a bunch of different motions and actually, I mean, the strategy here was just, we don't have a lot of time, so let's just throw everything at it that we can. And uh, some of the motions that we considered, you gotta do El Centro, right? Of course. And then a typical near fault, um, two to three second pulses, Silmar, Takatori. Um, those can be, Takatori is a very difficult motion for a typical base isolated building. Uh, then we looked at some very long period um, near fault pulses like from Chichi and Tabas. Uh, long period, long duration subduction. Sanamaru was a synthetic. Iwanuma recorded in the Tohoku earthquake. Japanese were particularly interested in that. And then one from Mexico City. What ended up controlling the design were those, those long period motions from Chichi and Tabas had very large spectral displacement demands out at the um, four to five second range, which is which we were, where we were aiming to go with that. So this um, configuration that we ended up with, nine isolators, one beneath each column. This is a picture, very large bearings, 1.4 meters in diameter. Um, I, these look to me to be about twice as large as the ones I see going in down in Christchurch right now, but maybe not, <laughs> not according to 
similar project that you have, uh, Barry. The lead rubber system, um, the isolation system was designed for um, extended design basis, very large motion, but on the eastern side of the US at a potential um, site that was being evaluated for a new nuclear power plant. We used a suite of, spi of site-specific motions um, that was developed for that site and came up with system parameters about an effective period of around two and a half seconds, uh, displacement capacity of about 60 centimeters for that system. We started out with four lead rubber bearings um, oriented at the corners and, you know, the it's a relatively lightweight structure, so um, at most four bearings to provide the required flexibility. But even with that, the stability was a concern to get out to the displacements that we wanted. And we really preferred a support under every column. So what we ended up doing with this system was uh, moving the lead rubber bearings over to the exterior locations to get the theory was to get them under a little more axial load not sure that it necessarily worked. Um, and then we introduced these essentially frictionless slider. It's called a cross linear bearing. It's a roller bearing, but frictionless slider that doesn't add anything to the base shear, but helps uh, support the axial load, provides stability. And this one had the advantage, so we thought, of tension resistance. Um, so and there's a picture of the sliders that were, were used there. Here's an overall comparison of the two systems. Um, so you, you can get a perspective. Um, the triple pendulum system, we're looking at a displacement capacity of more than a meter. You can see that its yield force is larger than the, the LRB system, and it's um, quite a bit more flexible with a second slope period of four and a half seconds compared to about two and a half seconds here. Um, okay, so we'll look at some results. Everyone wanted to see a direct comparison, and we really didn't do a good job of getting a direct comparison between the three systems because every motion that we wanted to impose on the isolation system was too big for that fixed space structure, would have yielded it, and we didn't have a safety catching system. The best direct comparison we have applies this 2D motion from the Tohoku earthquake at 100% scale in the isolated building and 70% in the fixed base building. I'll show you a video um, from that one. The two on the left, top is triple pendulum, bottom is LRB, and this is the fixed base on the right. You can see, you know, there's no damage to the structure here, but you can see the motion that's being felt by the fixed space building is a lot larger there. And there was no surprise here. Um, I have a plot of story acceleration over height. I call this an acceleration profile. The, the normalized one, um, the one on the, the right is normalized by PGA, and it really shows what happens with the two systems, that the accelerations are attenuated um, in the isolation systems, a little bit more in the triple pendulum compared to LRB, but not a huge difference there. And then accelerations get amplified over the height of a fixed space building. So, so no problems there. Um, this is an example from, of the triple pendulum in Kobe Takatori had a PGA of 0.9 G, a vertical PGA of 0.3 G, was relatively moderate. We saw an isolator displacement of about 56 centimeters there. If you watch, you see the nice movement of the isolator, this is so elegant. If you watch the top video, it's like the structure just moving rigidly and um, not much disturbance um, to the contents, so that was a nice one. I did mention that we designed the, um, those isolators for a meter of displacement, the triple pendulum system, and we really expected to see that in the test. The largest displacement we got was about 70 centimeters. I'll show you um, what that looked like. Watch that bearing, going way out, <laughs> that's 70 centimeters of displacement. Uh, that was a, a 2D motion, yeah, a 2D motion. 
Um, so I'm showing here a plot of the displacement traces of the, basically how those bearings moved in the XY plane, each one. And I have the test result versus the pretest analysis. And there's the peak that was seen in the test. And you can see our pretest analysis, we expected displacement to be larger. So what happened? After going and looking at the data um, and fitting looking really closely at the friction coefficient versus axial load, uh, the, some of those results are in, given in that paper, was determined that because a lot of the, some of the bearings were really lightly loaded, more lightly loaded than expected, and the friction coefficient tended to increase as the load on the bearings increased, so we got more effective friction in the system than was anticipated at the outset, and that was, that was the reason. This one is the largest displacement that we got in the other system um, under 1.1G 1 1 1 excitation, uh, isolator displacement of 55 centimeters. It's exactly what we were going for with that one. And you can see the movement of the bearing and the nice two-way movement of that, that's, that tension-capable slider. It's pretty nifty. Um, you can probably hear some clanging in the background in the video. That was, uh, that was bolt slip. It didn't really have, um, it, it, you know, it, it was a budget thing. <laughs> but it didn't really impact the results of the test, so not a big deal there. Um, this shows the displacement or movement of the bearings in this particular test, test versus analysis. Our pre-test analysis did a really good job here. There's the peak displacement in each isolator, and so something you might notice in this one, as you look across the plan of the building, the displacements were significantly different. Um, so I said 55 centimeters was the peak in the bearing. We got 59 centimeters in one of the sliders. But a lot of variation, which indicates this system was sensitive to torsion. And that shouldn't surprise us. The way we had the bearings configured on the edge instead of the corner, we didn't have it ideally configured for torsion. Um, on the other hand, the triple pendulum system did a much better job of mitigating the torsion. Uh, mass eccentricities are kind of naturally balanced as the um, resistance is proportional to the weight carried. So that was, both of the, these were kind of expected, but it demonstrates how the triple pendulum system can do a little bit better job in mitigating the torsion. Um, this one shows a view of the hybrid LRB system from above. And this is kind of fun because you can actually see that it's rotating a little bit. But again, it's a, it's a rigid body rotation. So I ask myself, does this have any bearing on anything? Is it important for design? Well, I think it's important in thinking about, and there have been a lot of detail, or a lot of issues in earthquakes about how that, the, the base of the, um, the base responds and how it's detailed to accommodate the displacement. So if you think as a designer of how it's gonna m rotate in plane, that's worth considering. Um, residual displacements, the triple pendulum system saw much larger residual displacements. This is each run and the residual displacement than the LRB system. Again, this is no surprise. This had nothing to do with the devices but how the systems were designed. With a longer period and a larger yield force, you're gonna get more residual displacements. So a peak of about 11 centimeters, which is not um, unsubstantial in the, the triple pendulum system. In the LRB, it was more like one centimeter. We got a jump here which occurred after we got some of that bolt slip and actually the plates slipped about one centimeter. So, all right. Vertical excitation kind of ended up stealing the show. I didn't really think a lot about what might happen. Um, I'll first talk just about the, you know, the raw effect of the vertical on vertical slab vibration and how that affected the non-structural uh, non systems in particular. This is a representative video. It was recorded in the hybrid LRB system at Vogel, 
about 0.5G vertical, or 5G, 0.5G acceleration. Ceiling panels are falling, the pipes are really loose. They had been loosened in prior tests. Um, getting a lot of content disruption. Okay. <coughs> Um, a really good direct comparison, I want to say really good, it caused a lot of controversy, but we had a good direct comparison here with this 3D Rinaldi motion that was applied vertically at the same intensity in each system. I need to point out that the horizontal motion was smaller for the fixed base building, but the vertical was consistent. All right, and uh, and to describe a little bit of, about what happened and why I think that it doesn't matter that the building was isolated in terms of vertical shaking. This is the three systems, the triple pendulum, LRB, and fixed. What was seen at the ground, the shaking at the ground level, about one, or the table, I guess, about one G in each of them, okay? This one up here represents what was recorded on the sixth floor right near a column. And there's some distinct differences here. And in this motion, the building on triple pendulums under 1G vertical acceleration actually had this little jump. And we could see it. We could see it in the videos. We could see it in the load cell data. There was this instantaneous liftoff. Very short duration, though. And um, what ended up happening is it slammed down back on the system. We got this acceleration spike that traveled up through the columns. And so it's happening there. The LRB, uh, scratching my head as to why that one was so large, but I think those um, sliding devices might have a little, they have some give too, so they could have had somewhat of the same phenomenon. And then the fixed base that was bolted tightly to the table didn't have that impact. Um, but I think what matters in terms of the non-structural components and what we saw was what was recorded out in the middle of the floor slabs. And despite what happened up here, it was almost the same in every case. Between about seven and eight G, yikes, recorded out in the, <laughs> in the middle of the sl floor slabs. And so I think, you know, that high frequency stuff was filtered out but there was a lot of amplification uh, of the motion. Um, I'll show you a video from that one. This is what, this is the roof level, each of the three systems. And it just kind of took out the ceiling. So, we hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> um, so, Similar damage observed in all three systems. Um, we went through and we really wanted to get a handle on this damage. So one of the students went through and he looked at every single video and kind of came up with classification system for the damage to the ceiling and the piping. And then we plotted the peak plotted the peaks against um, damage ratings against peak horizontal acceleration and peak vertical acceleration. And you see the scatter plot there of all the data points. And um, as I look at this, I would say I'm convinced that the damage to the ceiling and the piping, at least for this, was more closely correlated to vertical acceleration than horizontal. And if I draw a line here right through about two and a half G, almost all the data points below that are no damage. So I believe that that was about the threshold for where we started to see vertical induced damage to the ceilings and piping system, two to three G. That's fairly large. Um, but because we saw such a large amplification of the acceleration from the table up to the slabs, um, you know, it wasn't hard to get there. And this shows for all the vertical runs that we did throughout the program, ground motion number, peak acceleration recorded at every floor in the middle of the slabs. Um, you can see that, ex that acceleration is sort of increasing up the height. That probably isn't characteristic of tip typical systems, but it has something to do with the, this large mass that was at the top and probably um, affected the floors directly below it. However, I've looked a lot, done analysis of the floor system vibrations and the, the flexibility, the periods, and I don't believe this is 
what we see here is atypical of what we'd get in, a, um, in practice. You know, these are, if anything, stiffer than a typical um, floor slab because, you know, relatively short span. So I don't think it's unrealistic. Um, amplification factor is represented directly by this one on the right. I've normalized by the peak ground motion. So we see we're getting amplification factors of about three in the lower floors up to about average about six, some, sometimes a little bit larger at the roof. Um, so three is much better. If we could figure out how to get three, then maybe we'd be okay. <laughs> um, so this is where I start thinking about, you know, resiliency and what, how important was all this in terms of resiliency, when knowing what the vertical does. And I kind of thought about each of the damage um, observations that we, we made and how important they were and if anything could be done about them. For instance, there's the fallen ceiling panels. Um, well, you know, those might be relatively easily repaired. The same thing with damage to the ceiling grid system. Also, I think we could consider not using seismic bracing. That was one of the conclusions of the non-structural project. Doesn't really help with vertical. Um, we saw some partition damage, but it was really only uh, under these greater than 1G input, which hopefully we won't see too often. The ones that kind of concerned me the most were equipment. Um, right here, if you s get disruption to unanchored equipment or even anchored equipment, um, could significantly damage, and that's what a lot of people who are choosing base isolation are going for. And um, so, I mean, expensive stuff, we need to anchor it, and I think we need to re-examine the code anchorage requirements for non-structural because there's nothing in the code that accounts for that amplification um, d of, of motion. It's basically design it for the ground motion in the vertical direction. The other one that I kind of was worried about was w some of what we saw in the pipes, the rotation, you know, working loose of the pipes, and I think there's a potential for widespread water damage there. Um, we used flexible hoses in some of the sprinkler heads, and those worked great. And I think there's a possibility to do flexible pipe couplings as well. So in short, um, Without getting too panicked about this, if we use best practices detailing for non-structural components, we can probably get a lot of the way there. Oops. All right, some other interesting performance issues. I call this one load transfer, this, um, what happened in the, the hybrid system. And I'll start by showing um, bearing displacement history, different bearings in, this is the Diablo Canyon motion that I showed you earlier displacement in X and Y, and then I've taken and calculated the vector sum. And I'm gonna put that up there and then plot below it the axial force that was recorded in each of the lead rubber bearings. And you can see what we'd really expect here typically is an overturning. Some, you know, as the building moves from side to side, go, f load would go down in some bearings and up in the other, but that's not really what you're seeing here. You're seeing even considering overturning, all bearings, all of those lead rubber bearings are tending to unload at every large displacement peak. And in the next one, I'm adding them all together, the total axial force in all the lead rubber bearings, and don't ask me what it was in this, the other bearings because we didn't record it. <laughs> ah, shucks. <laughs> um, but, but you can see that, yeah, at every, um, at every displacement peak, there is a net transfer of load off those lead rubber bearings. So it must be going to the, the CLBs. And it's perfectly aligned with the displacement peaks. So to explain what's happening here, um, at the start of the test, suppose both of the bearings are in their undeformed configuration, they're each carrying some load. And then um, as both bearings, both types of devices start to deform, the lead rubber bearing under its load is wanna, gonna wanna kind of compress down as well. But because it has this other device, which is fairly stiff, and remember that really rigid diaphragm that I told you about, it can't, it's constrained against downward movement. So basically there's gotta be a force that's pulling it back up 
I call that delta P here acting in the negative or the opposite direction and that force is going over to the lead rubber bearing. And it was such a significant effect that it actually induced tension in our um, lead rubber bearings in, such, in some of the larger motions. Well, how significant is that? Um, I mean, the hybrid system accomplished a lot of what we wanted it to. It stabilized the isolation system, allowed a larger displacement, increased the period, provide resistance to overturning, all those good things, but it created the possibility of tension. I don't have an answer to this one yet, and I actually <laughs> tried to publish a paper on this one, and I'm going to cry because one of the reviewers says, this system is so terrible, it should never be used. And the other one says, you're making an issue out of nothing because a real base diaphragm would be totally compliant and this is a non-issue. I think the second reviewer probably has a point and this, this is definitely the stiffness of our base diaphragm was a big contributor here, but I, I don't know, the jury's still out. Jury's still out. We do think we can predict it, but it's really hard. <laughs> really hard. Not in normal software. Um, oh yeah, there's that base diaphragm. Okay. This was the most fun part <laughs> of the whole project. The part that I got really excited about, but no one else. I don't think, I don't think uh, the bearing manufacturers were very excited about this. <laughs> there was this um, amplification of horizontal accelerations due to coupling, horizontal vertical coupling. I'll point out the Rinaldi motion again. This, this People hated this example because it was such large vertical, but it points it out really, really clearly. The roof acceleration, horizontal roof acceleration in the, um, under 2D and 3D shaking, there is a huge increase. And same thing in the LRB system. There's also an increase in the fixed base, but it's not as large. Um, we believe there were two causes. The first was a coupling of the modes of the structure. The second was specifically the friction pendulum system related to the bearings. So I'll talk about the um, coupling, the modal coupling in the structure using an example from the hybrid LRB system first. Um, this shows an XY motion, my acceleration profiles, and a 3D motion on the right. I note that under an, a 2D motion, I have this nice first mode shape, isolation mode in the profile with a little bit of the first structural mode. Under the 3D motion, I kind of lose that nice, um, perfect first mode shapes, indication that some higher mode effects are showing up, especially in the Y direction here, the red one, and you can see the acceleration increasing. Um, another way to look, see the evidence is through the um, floor spectra. This is the floor spectra, every floor, 2D versus 3D in the X direction and the Y direction, and what I want you to notice here that in the Y direction there's these additional peaks. So it's indicating that another mode is participating. So the best way to track this down, we did a modal analysis of the building, and um, I'll start with the uh, spectra for the X direction. Um, there's a first set of peaks show up on every floor, that's the isolation mode. A uh, second set of peaks show up on floors one, two, three, not on floor four, because that, that was a node, and then five and six, so we think that's the first structural mode. Then just a little bit over, um, we get another peak in floors one, three, four, and six. We think that's the second structural mode, has a node at two and five. And that was it in the X direction. But in the Y direction, so these are the spectra for the Y, we we saw additional peak at every floor, and we think that it's this third, a third structural mode that if you see, according to our analysis, actually has some vertical participation in it. So we believe this mode was being driven by the vertical excitation, showed up, amplified the accelerations. In the friction system, friction pendulum bearings, I'll use a different example, um, a 2D motion, chili, 
perfect isolation mode shape. In the 3D motion, Takatori, and this one was actually a relatively 0.3G vertical shaking, um, was relatively moderate, but it's a great example because it shows really clearly what happened. You see, um, especially in the X direction, we've got a really different mode shape, really different mode shape. And in fact, we think that that closely follows the second structural mode because it has um, a node at the second and fifth floor and the accelerations are much lower than lower there. Um, there's the floor spectra, really distinct peaks on floors one, three, four, and six, um, showing the amplification of that mode. So why is it being amplified? Well, think about this. The, um, there's a plot of the base shear. You've got the friction bearing system, high frequency um, vertical motion causing the axial loads on the bearings to rapidly fluctuate. Um, and the resisting force, the restoring force, is proportional to the axial load. So as it's bouncing up and down, you're introducing a high frequency component into the base shear. And for this particular motion, uh, you can see it there. You can see that there's some high frequency fluctuations in the base shear. It happened to be tuned. This would, I don't think it would always, you'd have to analyze it. But in this particular case, it happened to be tuned to that higher mode in the structure and um, it caused, base shear drove it, caused that higher mode to be driven. Just what we're trying to get away from with an isolation system. In the um, 3D Rinaldi, the one with greater than 1G vertical, it had a big effect. And you can see this is the total axial force and you can see the fre high frequency fluctuation in the base shear that's exactly at the same frequency. And, um, you know, big effect there. Once we got our analytical models right, <laughs> it was all very predictable. So, um, you know, big picture, isolation, friction pendulum system, everyone knows it can get very long period shifts, so it can get the best attenuation. Um, and there's what you, it looks like in the 2D motion. 3D motion, you're still gonna get, you know, a good response, but there needs to be some recognition, depending on the performance objectives, that it's gonna have an effect, and it, it can be modeled and included. Still way better than a fixed space building. So um, practical implications, I mean, I, it is not my intent to draw attention away from the fact that we have a pretty darn good system here for protecting the structure, and so that should still be the takeaway message. Um, but at the same time, increasingly design of isolated buildings will be performance driven and performance of many components determined by acceleration requirements. Some owners don't have strict acceleration requirements. So in that case, maybe it doesn't matter. But if you do, if you're targeting a particular acceleration, I think you've got to include it in the analysis. Um, so many of the effects that, can be, that we saw in the test can be predicted by analysis and should be considered if performance requirements are strict. Like our amplification due to HV coupling, vertical slab vibration, um, axial force variation in high resistance, torsional response. The only question, can we predict the residual displacements? We haven't done a whole lot of work in that area. How about this question of resiliency? Things we can do now, explicitly consider vertical acceleration and use validated best practices for non-structural component detailing. I mentioned that already. Things we might think about, um, refined methodology for the design of non-structural components, um, design forces, I mentioned that. And another thing, can we do anything to mitigate this vertical slab vibration? First of all, I'm not sure we understand the motion that the building sees. We took three, we took free field ground accelerations and applied them to the shake table. But really there's, you know, foundation damping and the, the motion that the structure sees, especially in the vertical direction, I'm not sure we have a good handle on that. Um, secondly, how, how much do the floor system properties matter? Um, you know, we could, which is it better to design a stiff slab or a flexible slab? So those are things we can look at if you want to get really, like, um, you know, out there response control of the slab vibration.
All right. So I'm just transitioning here. <laughs> Before I move on, then acknowledge all the sponsors that contributed to this test, uh, the NSF, NRC, the I, um, I didn't mention Dynamic Isolation Systems, DIS in, the, in Reno, or in Sparks, Nevada, provided the bearings, um, LRBs, and worked with a company in Japan to provide the sliders. And a number of um, companies donated non-structural um, materials. Okay, so to transition, switching gears a bit. <coughs> provide some perspective on the recent major revision to ASC 716 Chapter 17, or alternatively, what have we done to our code? <laughs> uh, Quincy asked me to provide some perspective on this, going, given that you're going through a process of developing um, specifications for New Zealand standard of practice. Um, as far as this, I was loosely involved. Um, I was asked to participate kind of for technical support after the major direction uh, had been determined. Okay, so some background information. Initial code standards were developed by SEOC in the 1980s and implemented in the UBC in 1991. They underwent a major revision in 1997 and felt by many after that to be very conservative. Engineers pointed out that the standards held um, base isolated buildings to a much higher performance objective, but it wasn't it spelled out anywhere in the code. And you know, the implicit performance objective is life safety in a design earthquake. Um, so that there was this sentiment, and a number of base isolation advocates. Um, you have this feeling that base isolation could possibly be done in a cheaper way and still provide better performance than a comparable fixed space. So as an, I'm quoting a, I don't know if you can read this, but a paper from um, some practitioners written in 2002. They said, point of this paper is to identify inconsistencies in code treatment of fixed and isolated buildings. They provide an unfair basis for economic comparison and go on to say, as a result, isolation is rarely considered for common buildings in the U.S., partly, to, partly you know, due to the code. Um, so many of these same advocates um, have, were involved in the recent code rewrite, and then you look at what went in there and maybe don't think that everything is necessarily aligned with that objective. So what happened? A number of ideas were floated and not all of them held up under scrutiny. Uh, secondly, I think some attention was given to, you know, the issue of vertical, um, plus completion of cost studies that gave engineers the knowledge and the tools to talk more intelligently about cost benefit with their clients. Hence, I think there's been somewhat of a paradigm shift um, from the old paradigm hey, I want to use base isolation to offer improved performance to my client um, at little to no increased costs and opening its potential to a much wider class of buildings. The code prevents me from doing that. Whereas now, I think engineers are kind of saying, I accept that it's going to carry some significant additional first cost. If I'm going to recommend it to my client, I want to be able to provide some assurance you know, if I'm going to go out there on a limb, provide some assurance that they will see the performance they are looking for. New in ASC 716 for the first time, the commentary does lay out as um, explicit performance objectives. Um, it describes the performance that would be expected under an isolated building designed to this code, as well as pointing out the differences in expected performance between a fixed and an isolated building under different level earthquakes. So much has been made of the fact that um, we have moved to an all MCE design. Why did a group of practitioners <laughs> that were advocating for a level playing field decide that we should base the design of an iso isolation system exclusively on the MCE? Uh, well, one of the major justifications was that it was simpler. 
In ASC 7-10, you designed the structure for the design motion, the isolation system for the MCE, but then you had to do some checks um, of the structure at the MCE, and it was just all kind of confusing. So this was simpler. Plus, there was this notion of being able to provide enhanced performance. An early code justification wrote, greatly improve the reliability of the ELF to meet MC performance objectives. And then finally, there was uh, this argument that in increase was arguably balanced by the removal of other sources of conservatism. So let's look at those. Design of the isolation system under ASC 7-10 was always controlled by the MCE, lower bound, but the base shear was different. Um, this shows a representative lower bound loop, which is thought to control the displacement, and upper bound loop, which is thought to control the force or maximize the force. The code said the design displacement is computed using KD min, lower bound properties, okay? But then the base shear was computed using the upper bound stiffness and that lower bound displacement. So I'll draw, draw a line, shows you what that looks like. Upper bound stiffness, but instead of taking it out to the upper bound displacement, we'll take it out further, all the way to the lower bound displacement. Hence, that's a source of conservatism to compare those two together. Not only that, the equation for damping also specified to use KD max, the upper bound um, stiffness, and to choose the cycle of energy dissipation that minimizes E sub D. So again, they're trying to get the lowest possible damping value, which doesn't align with the lower bound properties of the system. So another source of conservatism. Um, this is what ASC 716 does. It says um, displacement, both displacement and base shear determined by the MC, hence the M on the subscript, but displacement is uh, determined separately using a consistent set of upper and lower bound properties. Then the base shear, again, determined separately using upper and lower bound properties with the, con the same displacement. And the intent here is that basically you do two analyses, one, on the upper one with the upper bound properties, one with the lower bound, and for each response quantity, take independently take the largest one that controls, okay? So it's more rational for sure. Um, interestingly enough, there's a table in the commentary that assesses for some representative cases the base shear that you would get under ASC 7-10 and ASC 7-16 and shows that in the majority of cases, the base shear actually goes down under ASC 716 despite the MC-based design. So go figure. Um, I'll, I'll outline quickly, hopefully, a, a number of other changes that really originated from this movement in the 2000s where um, everyone was talking, advocates were talking about how conservative it was. A complaint was there were excessive limits on the application of equivalent lateral force. Basically pushed you into response history analysis for every um, system and they suggested removing the, the limits or relaxing some of the limits. Some changes were made, removed restrictions on the seismicity, um, removed the height restriction, as long as you can sh show no tension in the isolators, and extended the period limit from three to five seconds, but added a damping limit. And the bounds um, are based on a parameter study that I'll talk about next. Um, the second sort of observation, next two suggestions concern the distribution of lateral forces in the structure. So the isolation people noted that the structure base shear is the sa same as the isolator base shear, so no recognition for inertial force at the base level. Also, the forces were distributed triangularly over the height, more like you know a fixed space building with a triangular for linear first mode shape. And what these, suggestion was made was to go back to a uniform 
um, distribution of forces, and that was what was originally in the 1991 code. Um, but this is based on the linear theory of isolation, and whereas, you know, practically speaking, all isolation systems are nonlinear. So some troublemakers by the name of York and Ryan did a parameter study, um, <laughs> time history analysis, and determined that the, the parameters of the isolation system matter a lot. Um, the code committee did some follow-up studies and came up with some revisions to the force distribution. Mainly, um, the, shape, the shape of the lateral forces is determined by this factor K, which depends on the damping, effective damping ratio, uh, beta sub M and TFB, the, the stiffness of your fixed base building, okay? And to help interpret this, um, K equals zero represents a uniform first mode shape, applies when you have a really lightly damped system or a really stiff super, and a really stiff superstructure, then linear theory works well. As the damping is increased and um, the period of the structure itself is increased, K goes up, you're gonna see more higher mode effects. Um, and you know, if designers found this to be too penalizing, they can always go back to a history analysis. So there's the changes that were made um, there. There were also some discussion about the requirement of having an essentially elastic superstructure. Um, that goes back to the equal playing field. You're ho holding isolation to a much higher performance objective and they suggested reconsidering the limits, the upper bound limits on the, the force reduction factor. A number of studies looked at this and it was generally uh, concluded that it's pretty difficult to design an isolated building for controlled ductility. Once the structure yields, it's gonna tend to accumulate large inelastic displacements much faster than a fixed space building. So it's a real slippery slope there. Um, it's, despite that, there was an exception introduced to the code that you can exceed the R limits if you do a pushover analysis and show um, a, signif a, a sufficient um, sa a factor of safety on the strength of the building relative to the MCE base shear. Um, another angle that was considered was, well, if you're gonna have to design an elastic structure, why have ductile detailing requirements? So it suggested easing up on the detailing requirements. One change that was made to the code along those lines is to permit the use of steel ordinary concentric braced frames, very non-ductile system with an R equals one up to 160 feet tall. There are some, and apparently, you know, they are commonly used, were commonly used with isolation. Um, some additional requirements from AISC 341 apply, as well as you have to increase the moat, required moat width by an additional 20%, and that was based on a FEMA P695 collapse assessment. Um, Peer review, everyone always complained about peer review, and I think there were some early projects, so I heard that you know got really bogged down by peer review requirements, cost a lot of money, and everyone was disillusioned with it. Um, suggestion was to exempt simple structures from the peer review. What ended up getting implemented is now only one peer reviewer is required. You know, you can choose how many is appropriate for your project. And importantly, reviewer is no longer required to attend the prototype testing, which was just silly. But I don't know if it ever really happened <clears throat> anyway. Um, whoops, testing requirements. There's a discussion uh, <laughs> revolving around that. Testing requirements are cumbersome. Suge several suggestions were made to simplify them. Um, what ended up getting implemented in the code is we no longer have to do prototype testing for every single project. If there is um, available test data from the manufacturer, similar size devices, it can substitute for the prototype tests. And the lambda factor methodology from the bridge world was introduced, um, which allows you to determine upper bound and lower bound properties based on lambda factors based on prior test data. 
Uh, the catch is that they also introduce the environmental factors and aging and so on that increase the bounds a little bit, but it, the, the real benefit here is it allows the designer to complete the design prior to proto without waiting for prototype tests to be finished and really speeds up the process. So that's overall a good thing. And after talking about the e-defense test for 40 minutes, uh, did anything from that project make its way into ASC 716? Well, direct 